So the question most of you have to be asking is, how does a guy like me get a gig like this? <laughs> you know, pretty, pretty impressive, you know, to, to be here in the old historic chapel. I've done lots of stuff in this chapel in my life, and it keeps getting improved. Um, although I see that they still haven't cocked that door in because I can see daylight through all those boards. <laughs> And that one too, yeah. But well, at least we get a cross draft that way. <laughs> but I've done many, many weddings in here and um, some s celebration of life for people. And so this place is uh, very familiar to me. It's got a really comfortable, beautiful vibe. And, and I was so excited to do this presentation because of my personal history and connection to Summit County. Uh, in 1859, what happened in Colorado? Gold. Right, and, and before that, the only Europeans that were hanging out around here were French fur trappers, who uh, French Street and Breckenridge, and that's all after those guys, the, that's where the trappers were. And in the six, early 1600s, the Spanish made it as far as Summit County, and they found, now this is fabled, I'm not sure this is empirically documented, but the Spanish found a, um, a piece of gold, a sliver of gold, that was the shape of a, t a tiger tail, and today we call that tiger run. So those were the only Europeans that the Utes had seen back in the day. But in 1859, my great-grandfather and grandmother with a six-month-old baby boy showed up in Colorado with three Conestoga wagons and an ox cart. And in one of those Conestoga wagons was everything they needed to set up their house. And in the other two wagons were everything they needed to set up the first general store and post office in Black Hawk, Colorado. And my great-grandfather was the first postmaster of the territory of Colorado. Darling, you can come up here. There's a seat up here, and that hat will block somebody's view for sure. <laughs> Keep it on, though. It's cold in here. And that six-month-old boy survived. His name was Charles, and he was the first chair fiddle player in the very first Tabra Opera House Orchestra in Leadville, and is buried in the Pioneer Cemetery in Leadville. I've done eight concerts in, that, in the Tabra Opera House, and every time I go there, I feel these, this warm embrace of the spirit of my ancestors. But my great-grandparents had five more children here in Colorado, and they all lived. Now, in those days, the infant mortality rate was over 70%. How many little babies do you see? We have two little babies here. How many little babies do you see on oxygen that are born up here, right? I mean, it's a big deal. You know, most of the little kids get put on oxygen almost right away till they really get their lungs developed. I have a nephew who was born in Crested Butte. Both his lungs collapsed when he was born and had to be flight for life to Denver and Hunter. And, um, and is, but he's now a PGA golf pro, so he did fine. He? <laughs> so all six of those kids lived and, and prospered. Now, <clears throat> And so that one Conestoga wagon was their household, the other two was their store, but the ox cart ties into what we're going to talk about today. Because in that ox cart was an 800-pound solid rosewood square grand piano, violins, mandolins, and banjos, and I still have all those instruments. My great-grandparents were both classically trained musicians and artists and poets and left a real legacy for us here. So the pioneer side of my family has got a very, very deep roots here. My grandfather was born in Central City in 1863. My dad was born in Silver Plume, Colorado in 1899 and I was born here in 1950. Now, if, if you do the math, all the guys in my family don't have kids till they're about 50. 
or I'd be like seventh generation. But only third, because my dad was 52 when I was born. So thank God he found a young Navajo girl, because my mother's side of the family had been here for 12,000 years that we know of before the pioneers showed up. So that's why a guy like me gets a gig like this, because when I was a little boy and I started learning about my family history, I was completely intrigued and enthralled. And there was also music involved. So when we would go to Taos to Pueblo, to the Taos Pueblo for ceremony, I would glue myself to the old flute player and light his cigarettes and bring him coffee and, and do anything to have him let me have a chance at playing that flute. And learning about the history and asking the elders, how did this happen, what happened? And that lifelong pursuit has turned into something that I really have a good time doing, which is exactly what we're doing this afternoon. And it's sharing with you a history of what the Ute did here for thousands of years before the pioneers showed up. We've got some chairs up here, guys. Debbie will move over. She's, she's right here. You guys live across the street from me. You could have made it earlier. I, mean, I, I could have picked you up and brought you. So the first thing that I would like to do is the same thing I do for Colorado Mountain College and for historical societies and libraries all around the state where I go visit and do programs like this. And that's ask you a question. You know, I learned, I, I was, uh, I went, my mother was very, very serious about making sure I went to private schools my whole life because she was born in 1911 in a one-room dirt floor adobe and never got to go to school. But she became the private secretary of the president of AT&T because she was so smart and self-taught. So she wanted to make sure her kids got the best education they could get. So I learned some of the techniques that I'm going to use today from Sister Mary Gasoline. <laughs> So just pretend you're in Sister Mary Gasoline's class, and she holds up this map and says, does this look like a familiar landmass to you? Anyone recognize this? If I turn it this way, you won't recognize it. But like this, you recognize it, right? Everybody knows where this is. The 48 contiguous United States of America, right? So, 1491. Let's think about what happened in 1492. Well, actually, that's not true. In 1492, the indigenous tribes discovered Christopher Columbus lost at sea. I'm going to tell you the truth here today. So let's start off by making it right, OK? And he thought he was in India, so they call us Indians. We're just glad he didn't think he was in Turkey. <laughs> so in this landmass, how many people lived here in 1491? Pre-contact, how many people lived here? How many? Well, there were, there were over 15,000 Ute right here. So I'd say you've got to, that's, I'd say that's kind of off. A couple hundred thousand, 250,000. <laughs> the conservative estimate by people with PhDs behind their name that are archaeologists, the conservative estimate is 50 million. And the indigenous archaeologists believe that that is like half, that there was a, possibly a hundred million people. Now, you're all educated people. And when you hear that, you realize that you've been lied to your whole life. And that the conqueror writes the history, and they didn't want you to know how many people were here. Because it's the largest genocide that has ever taken place on planet Earth happened right here. Now I'm not trying to bum you out, 
I'm just trying to get you prepared for the fact we're going to talk about reality today. Okay? We're going to talk about what really happened and how things really took place. Not the John Wayne history. Okay? Because we grew up with TV, and we thought there was just maybe every now and then they'd see an Indian. They, they were everywhere they went. The biggest mistake they made is they were nice to the Europeans and tried to help them out. Now, this map is particularly wonderful because it has all of the names, the original names, in the exact locations of the 647 tribes we know of that existed in 1491. So when I'm done today, you're very welcome to come up here and look at this map. Wherever you're from, you can see what tribes. Now, how many of you know what tribe lived right here in Summit County? The Ute, the Ute right. Okay, they're called the Nutzi. N-U-N-T-Z-I, Nutzi. So the Nutzi had five major families, and in those five major families, there was close to 100,000 people. So we really need to understand who lived here. Now, here, this is an interesting thing, and I love coming to historical societies like Frisco, of which I'm very fond of because of my pioneer history in my family, but I'm always amazed how 95% of the museum is about pioneers. They lived here for 44 years, destroyed everything in their path, cut down all the trees, poisoned the water, and you know, left scars in the mountains. And the people who lived here for over 12,000 years get very little recognition. So it's really up to us to honor the ancestors whose land this really is. Now, I heard one time somebody say, oh, Summit County, it's such a transient place. So many transient people in Summit County. And my response was, well, then you should move away. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Ute were very transient. Okay? They only lived here for part of the year. And if you want to know why, look outside. When I was a little boy, the Blue River Valley, which you now know as Lake Dillon, was one of our very favorite places. I was 12 years old before they started flooding the lake. So I remember that valley really, really well. In fact, I have a very, very clear memory in 1957 that my dad and my mother and my sister and I had a picnic right at the confluence of the Snake in the Ten Mile, and, or the Blue in, in the Ten Mile, and, my, and <clears throat> my dad and I took a bicycle pump and pumped up the, those air mattresses, remember those? Those things would stay inflated for sometimes 15 seconds. <laughs> and my mom and my sister laid down in the shade under a tree, and my dad and I took a walk See, I told you people would start showing up. <laughs> and my dad and I took a walk up this dirt street. And as we walked up, we came up to a place where there was a bunch of log cabins with green roofs. And I told my dad, I like this town. This is a Lincoln Log town. <laughs> and my dad said, no, son, this is Frisco. And I said, oh, I'm going to live here. And that was it. From the time I was seven years old, I was going to live in Frisco because it was a Lincoln Log town. <laughs> so I have a lot of love for this place, and I've lived here for a really long time. And in those days, I was 22 years old when they paved Main Street. So I was already playing gigs and bars before Main Street got paved. The the thing that my dad really always impressed upon me was that his father, who was born in Central City, and his grandfather, who I mentioned earlier, my great-grandfather, always told my dad, this isn't our land. 
This land belongs to the Ute. They were really, really clear on that. Really, really clear. And my dad, who was an artist, here's a guy that was born in, in Silver Plume in 1899, had an eighth grade education, and became the art director for an upstart company called AT&T. <laughs> and in 1926, it was his idea to put the commercial phone directory on yellow paper. So when I was a kid, I'd say, Dad, you invented the yellow pages. He'd go, I, we didn't call it the yellow pages. That was marketing's idea. It's the commercial directory. So a boy from Silver Plume invented the yellow pages. But he was real clear on my mother's heritage and the heritage of the family that had always lived here and to be connected with that. And he was also real clear about being connected with the mountains, the nature, and the trees. And he was the first one to teach me that the trees, that every tree has a spirit, everything has a spirit and energy to it. And this is especially good for ski instructors to understand that the natives here didn't call the trees the forest, they called it the standing people. That's where the standing people live. And the standing people are always in balance. And their roots are attached to the earth and their branches reach the sky. So the standing people hold wisdom and grace and inspiration. Now, the Ute would come over from west of here across several different ways. And a lot of those are hiking trails now. If you hike up these trails that go up towards the gore and over towards Vale, they would come in that direction. And they would come here in the fall. So they would come about midsummer and they would stay here through the fall. You know why? It's our best time of year. And who else was here? The elk, the deer. And the Blue River Valley was full of cutthroat trout. I don't think I ever waited five minutes before I got a strike on my, on my fishing line. You know, I mean, we'd throw, we'd throw in the line and you'd stand there and you'd get in and here comes lunch. It was really fertile. It was really beautiful. And this was very, very sacred ground. And what they called this valley that we live in is Na'aunkara. And you may have seen that. There's a, a plaque on the, the bicycle path on Lake Dillon that on a, a point down there, if you get off the path, a little header that goes off the path there, and there's a little thing down there about it. That's the only place I've ever seen it published. But my dad would tell me that story. This is Na'aunkara which means where blue water meets the sky. Now, once again, this isn't empirical evidence, this is fabled evidence, but I think that's where the Blue River got its name. Because the pioneers learned this is Naonkara, where blue water meets the sky, and hence the Blue River, the blue. Okay? So Naonkara, really, really a beautiful thing to remember. And when the Ute came, for the first time, the, when the miners were here, there's a great story about how their first encounter went. And they would send scouts out before the rest of the tribe as they were coming over. And that particular year, the scouts smelled something and then saw dense black smoke and knew something was up. Because fire's not good if you're on foot, right? And they came over, and here was a whole group of men. They had seen Europeans before. It wasn't the first time they'd... And there were stories about Europeans. If they hadn't seen them, they had told stories about them. But these guys were exceptionally dirty. They were dirty. They smelled bad, and they were going in and out of holes. And the men would disappear into a hole and then bring buckets of dirt out and dump it and go back in. 
And the only thing that they had ever seen do that was insects. <laughs> so the scouts came back to the chief and the holy man and said, we've encountered some very strange men. They have bred with insects. <laughs> so they immediately thought less of these dirty men who were cutting down all the trees and poisoning the water. So when the tribe got here, they hung out. And back then, there was a tent city right about where I-70 and Main Street intersect, right in that vicinity there. So they came down at night and burned it down. And <clears throat> the miners didn't take kindly to that, of course, and um, re rebuilt it, obviously, and stayed. And it wasn't long before the conflict began. Now, the Ute had been really, really kind and generous and open to people like Lord Gore, who was a butcher. And, you know, if we could change the name of the Gore Range, I love that range. It's so beautiful. But it was called, the Ute called it the Shining Mountains. And I really think that's what we should call it. You know, and, and on a spring day when the sun's shining and the snow's got that it's silver, man. It's, you, can, you see why it's called the Shining Mountains. And so let's back up a little bit and think about what life was like in the tribe pre-contact. So we're going to go back 10,000 years. And the really cool thing about doing this is if we go back in our imaginations, we get younger. So it's really cool. Let's think what it was like to live here 10,000 years ago. Now, if you close your eyes and picture an Indian, I can guarantee I know what you're seeing. It's a male in a feather headdress on a pony with a teepee and a squaw. John Wayne history. So let's talk about a few of those things and then we'll go back and talk about what it was really like. When do you think they got the horse? So we know that was the 1500s, right? They'd been around a long thousands and thousands and thousands of years before they ever had horses. So the entire horse and teepee culture, how do you think you can move a teepee without a horse? Now, let's talk about a teepee for a second. You need 18 lodge poles, and you need about 20 buffalo hides, and each hide weighs 50 pounds. Two squaws. Two squaws. <laughs> A Mormon Indian, right. <laughs> so before the horse, there weren't any teepees. Wikiups, that's right. They lived in what's called a wikiup. Now, you guys ever seen any moose up here? Where do they like to hang out? In the willows. Now, you know what the red, the red willow, you know, in um, Tigua, in New Mex northern New Mexico, the word for red willow is taus. <laughs> so in the taus, in the will red willow, and with cedar, cedar happens to be a very sacred wood, they would build wikiups. Now, they were just small huts, and you'd take a rabbit skin or two and some mud and put a roof on it. And the only time you were in there is when you were asleep or it was raining. Otherwise, you live outside. It's called the House of Light. And there's many stories in, in many tribes about we live in a house of light. They didn't consider the wiki up their house. They considered the world their house. The wiki up is how you get out of the wet. Okay? 
And that's how they lived. And they would leave these wikiups and sites where they would go hunt. And the next year when they came back, they'd chase the spiders out or wherever had moved in and, and sleep in there again. So that entire iconic Indian with the headdress and the pony and the teepee is a 250-year-old deal. Now the Ute got the horse from the Navajo. Okay, now this is why my bloodlines have both those tribes in them. The Ute and the Navajo liked each other, but the Navajo met the Spanish long before the Ute did, and the Navajo started stealing their horses. Now, what do you think, why would tribes find reason to get together? Tr squaws. <laughs> you need fresh blood. You need to keep the bloodline fresh, so you're going to go visit a neighboring tribe and check out the chicks. That's what it's all about. And if you find a chick you really like and you got a horse, her dad's going to say, you got her. <laughs> She's yours. Give me that horse. So that's kind of how it worked, okay? Everybody, it was the culture. It's not like we all go, ah. So, uh, the, the girls were looking for good guys, too, you know. They wanted, to, they wanted to get out from under their parents, you know. Nothing's changed, you know. Let's move on. So the Ute got the horse. In Colorado, they were the first tribe to get the horse. Before the Arapaho, before the Cheyenne, before the Comanche, the Ute had the horse. So right here, they had horses. So they were, they were moving pretty quick. Now, before the horse. Now remember, the horse was technology. Okay? So before the horse, you had wiki-ups, you were on foot, and that's how you hunted. And that's how you moved, and you were nomadic. So a tribe would be 20, 30, maybe 40 people? And how did you get a tribe? It's like, oh, you've got skills, you've got skills, you've got skills. You, let's get together. Right? So a tribe would be like an extended family. You're probably people you had known, that you liked, and you got together, you had like minds, you had different skills, you thought you could survive, and it was all about survival. That was your job every day was to survive. That's what you did for a living. On your teepee, your sign on your teepee said, survive. So that the tribes were small, and they had to be, they were on foot. After technology of the horse came, tribes got bigger and more mobile. Now, before the horse, how do you think they hunted elk? Spears, bow, and arrow, yeah, but how, how do you, you know, I mean, you can't, they, their bows weren't that powerful. I mean, they, you know, a, a bow made of red cedar, maybe 30 pounds, 40 pounds. You can kill something with it, you got to get really close. What they would do, what they got really good at doing is finding, finding their migratory paths and laying in wait, but they would smear elk fat on their bodies and put an elk skin over them and crawl on their hands and feet so they looked and smelled like an elk, and when they got close enough, they'd ram the spear into its lungs. And then if it fell over on you, you were dead. Now, if you got an elk, that was big time eating. Because most of the time you're eating squirrels and porcupines and other things that are easier to catch. Birds, fish, okay? So that, a deer or an elk, that's, boy, that's big. That's time to everybody, the big party. Let's all get together and play the drum and dance and have a good time. So the Ute were so, so important because they... Then the Arapaho would come up, and the, and the Ute would go down, and they, there was, they clashed. And the Ute and the Cheyenne didn't get along at all. And here's the reason. The Cheyenne were tall as a tribe, and they were fair-skinned, and they wore lots of ornate elk's teeth and jewelry. And, and, and the Cheyenne called themselves the beautiful people. 
So nun si in you, you know what that means? People. You know the Navajo word, the Diné. You know what that means? People. Lakota means people. So what did they call themselves? People. Okay? But the Cheyenne called themselves the beautiful people. <laughs> and the Ute were short and stocky and muscular and very dark skinned, and the Cheyenne didn't like them. They were racists. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I've always been amused my whole life is people come up to me and say, oh, I just love your Indian spirituality and native culture and, and, and the, you know, the native spirit. I'm so, I, I just love Indian spirituality. It's like, w what is that? You know, the, the beautiful spirit of your, the Indians. And it's like, they didn't have a word for that. They were people. They were just like we are. They, they weren't any different. They didn't like each other if they looked different. I mean, they, they didn't all get together and, you know, hunakata uh, matata, you know. I mean, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't happening, you know. They were, they were if we were hunting and, and we see somebody from a tribe, we don't like the way they look, we chase them away, right? Now, were they violent? Did they have violent conflicts? Very rarely. What they did was called counting coup, which would mean you embarrass the shit out of somebody in front of their friends and send them home. That was much more effective than, than trying to kill them because they're not going to come back. So <clears throat> the Ute and the Arapaho would share hunting grounds sometime. And, and the Arapaho had something the Ute really liked called buffalo. And there were a lot of buffalo in Colorado. When my dad was a little boy, Buffalo Bill lived across the alley from him, and he used to tell him stories. And he told him that the first time he came to Colorado, the buffalo herd was crossing the railroad track for five days. The train had to stop for five days. And they just stood there on cars shooting the buffalo, and they just kept walking. There were millions of them. So getting a buffalo is a big deal. Good hides, good for teepees. Now, you got to remember that up here, the elk was Walmart. Okay? It's your clothing. It's your meat. You used every part of the animal. Elk's front teeth are ivory. They wore them as jewelry. So they used everything. And they used the brains and the eyes in a mixture of herbs to tan the skin. It's called brain tanned. My regalia is brain tanned elk's hide. And if I get stuck in the rain, I smell like an elk for a week. <laughs> Delightful. <laughs> so let's now imagine what that life must have been like. There was no I-70, no Eisenhower Tunnel, no Loveland Pass. You'd pass, but it was a foot trail. Now, as a boy growing up, my fascination with the history really centered and revolved around the music, the art, and the culture. I've always been super curious as to how, where did they get music then? Now, remember growing up, I was going to schools where they taught music and stuff, which I resisted. <laughs> Sister Mary Gasoline used to hit my hands with that pointer, and I broke it over my knee and ran away from school and got in a lot of trouble. It started my music career because that night at, after I knew I was in big trouble because, well, the cops came and, you know, and, and, uh, and my dad made, me, made a deal with me. I said, I don't want to take music lessons anymore. And he goes, well, but you play three instruments. I said, yeah, but I don't like lessons. And he goes, I'll make a deal with you. You never have to take another music lesson if you play every single day. Like, deal. Done. Still played three hours this afternoon. So my fascination with the music was 
we had all these instruments. I had a grand piano in my living room. I had mandolins and violins, right? I could play with every day. But how did, how did my native ancestors come up with music? And when we'd go to gatherings and there'd be a flute player, I'd always be like, oh, that's the bomb right there. How does this work? So I started studying and asking with the elders of the tribes. Now, once again, there's no recorded history of how the elders came up with music, but there's great stories. And I once asked a Tiwa elder, how did the ancestors create music? And this is the story he told me. So I want you to imagine 10,000 years ago in the standing people, a young mother. And when I say young, I mean young. She's probably a teenager and she has a baby. And she's out in the woods with other young mothers with babies because the men, well, you know what the men are doing. The men wake up every morning, they find some tracks, they chase it down till it's dead, they bring it back, and they watch the game. <laughs> but the women are the gatherers. The women are out tanning the hides from the day before, making sure the fire stays lit, looking at herbs, finding different things in. The women are multitasking. You know, men's brains are a series of boxes that don't touch. Women's brains are a cacophony of colored wires that intersect in a million places. Started a long time ago. So the women are alone and they're gathering. And if the baby starts to cry, what happens? Well, there's things with claws and teeth that are hungry if they hear a baby crying that's the dinner bell and that can be very dangerous and the women all know this so the baby starts to cry and the mother does what comes natural to her she goes ah, ah, ah. It's the same vibration the baby heard in her belly, right? And that starts to become language. Which means everything's going to be okay. And this other young mother hears this other mother singing and the baby's being quiet. And she thinks, great idea. But her song's a little different. And the two women start singing together. The band's together. We're going on the road. Now remember, these women are gathering. They're looking for food and medicine and, and herbs and things that they can use and that they can create with. And they're experimenting and they're really being inventors. Now, think about this. This is the origin of humans. I mean, we're not birds, you know. We, we don't just sing naturally. We have to have a reason. We howl at the moon, but there's usually tequila involved. <laughs> So women created music, and that's why music is so intricately, intricately in, in, entwined, inextricably entwined in our cultures, is because it's our ancient grandmothers telling us everything's going to be okay. If you go somewhere and there's no music, you like a restaurant, you start looking around going, something's missing. If you went to a wedding and there was no music, it'd be like something missing, right? It's our ancient grandmothers telling us everything's going to be okay. So women created the first music. Now, they're 
out there gathering and they come across something that looks like this. You know what this is? A gourd, right. And it dries in the sun and you pick it and it goes. Now I've got a baby strapped right here and I go like this, what does the baby do? Pam, you just did it, starts to laugh. What do we give to babies to this day? It's like, oh, that works, right? So they find all kinds of things that make sounds. Right? And here's my absolute favorite. Ready? These are all seed pods and gourds, okay? So now the women start making sounds to the babies, to the children, and after dinner. Why ha yo ho 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 na. So all of us guys return from a big hunt. We've had a really great day. We're ready to have a big feast. We got something like a squirrel. <laughs> so we get everybody together. We cook that squirrel up. We each get a bite. <clears throat> Things are good. And then it's like to the mothers and grandmothers, play those songs for us. And the women start to become storytellers. And the songs start to become the story of their day. Like, we saw a great big bear today. We scared his ass and chased him away. <laughs> and, the, and the guys and, and the whole family's going, wow, this is awesome. Right? So these are what we call, us music historians, of which I'm the only one I know, <clears throat> found instruments. The stuff we found in nature, we did was put a handle on it, okay? Found instruments. But we know that humans can be very inventive. <coughs> and this is a manufactured instrument. Now, let's talk about the components of this. First of all, sounds great. Great sound. The handle, remember the wiki ups? Bows, red cedar. This is a very old instrument, still very flexible. Okay? And what do you think this is? Now remember, they used everything that the elk had to offer. This is elk bladder. You knew. What they would do is they would, now I don't know if you guys know this, but stomachs expand. <laughs> and pants don't. <laughs> so they would take the intestine, the stomach, the bladder, soak it in the stream, and stretch it. <clears throat> Put a rock in it, leave it in the sun. It gets hard as a rock and it takes the shape of the rock. And what do you think is inside? Corn. Now, okay, pretty inventive. And then what's it stitched with? Sinew, it's the same thing. They, they take the, the gut and make it into a thread-like strip and it's wet and it's stretchy and they sew it together and put it in the sun and it shrinks. It's not coming apart. That's how they sewed the teepees together. It's how you sewed your hides. That's how you sewed your clothing together. It's incredibly effective. And those seams are actually sealed. They don't leak. When you sew them with, stitch them with sinew, they won't leak. Okay, so th they really had their shit together. Now, let's talk about the three components that make this rattle and why. Certainly creative, certainly inventive, but red cedar, we make our bows, our spears, our tool handles, and our wiki-ups from red cedar, sacred wood. The elk is Walmart, <clears throat> sacred animal. And the only, three plant, the only three agricultural crops that they grow are corn, beans, and squash. 
makes a great hash. We call it the Three Sisters, corn, beans, and squash. It's really delicious. Put a little venison in there, you got a meal, okay? Very full of protein. Now, sacred wood, sacred animal, sacred crop. This is a form of prayer. This is, they made this to give thanks to the nature for abundance. When you have something like this, it means you're prospering, you're doing good. This is a sign of prosperity. This is a natural gift from the earth. And so they made them in all kinds of shapes and sizes and they each sound different. I'm going to pass these around so you can get a better look at them. Remember, they're old and they're fragile. And they come in a lot of different sizes. I had a woman grab this one one day and say, what's that? And go, elk testicle. <laughs> and so these have become so sacred over time that for ceremony, when we find one we really like the sound of, man, we put beads on it and stuff, make it really... That's a cool one, isn't it? So now we've got manufactured instruments. So the women at night are singing their songs and telling their stories and playing their rattles. And the guys are going, wow, the girls are having all the fun. We got to join the band somehow. What kind of instrument do you think that men came up with? There's nothing subtle about a man. Now, I heard this great story about where the first drum came from. And this is a great example of what the early drums look like. This is buffalo hide stretched over cottonwood with my hand on it. This symbol, by the way, this, the reason I chose this, and you see it in pictographs oftentimes in, uh, if, you, if you are fortunate enough to find some ancient ruins, means one people, one tribe. That's what that hand stands for. One tribe, one people. It's a sign of unity, okay? And it sounds great. So being a curious sort, I asked where, who got the first drum? I mean, where did that idea come from? And this is the story that grandfather told me. When the earth was new, very young, there was an old, old man. He was hundreds of years old. And he had long white hair that flowed all the way to the ground. And everywhere he stepped in his moccasin print, a flower would grow. And he could talk and understand the language of all of the animals. But this old man could do something that no one else had ever done. He could talk to trees. He would place his hands on the standing people and they would tell him the stories that they knew. They would tell him the stories of Mother Earth and of Father Sky. And one day while this old man had his hands on an old sacred tree, it encouraged him to find its brother tree that had fallen over in a windstorm hundreds of years before and had become hollow. And he instructed him to stretch hide over it and to play it for the tribe to remind them that this is the sound of the heartbeat of Mother Earth. And that we all come from the same mother and never forget that we are all from the Earth and instructed him to go from tribe to tribe and teach the people to be one people with one earth and one mother. Now that's why we love drums so much. We like drums so much, 
we have iconic people with names like Ringo. <laughs> you know, I heard a story once that John Wayne came up here camping. In the middle of the night, he and his sidekick are sound asleep, and from the other side of the hill, they hear. John Wayne wakes up his sidekick and says, Pilgrim? I don't like the sound of those drums. And a voice from the other side of the hill says, He's not our regular drummer. Now, here's something else that's really cool. Now, this is more from the Pima tribe from Arizona. This is a cactus. The only thing is that this cactus has had all of the little spikes and needles pushed inside. And then it got plugged up on both sides because I want to hold the seeds in because it does something really cool. Now, they call these rain sticks now because they become real popular and you can buy them in all kinds of gift shops. But this was another form of how they created percussion and music. But what an ingenious thing to do to take a cactus and push the needles in and then let the seeds become the part of the instrument. Pretty cool, huh? So the next instruments I'm going to introduce you to have a really fabulous history. Some years ago, probably 10 years ago, when I was doing research, I found that archaeologists in Slovenia had found a 60,000-year-old Neanderthal cave bear bone flute. It was in three pieces, and so they very carefully, uh, however they did this, got, measured it, took photographs of it, and then with a 3D printer, made an exact replica of it. So they couldn't really put it back together. It's 60,000 years old, and they don't really want to touch it, right? But they were able to reconstruct it with a 3D printer. It had three holes. Now, remember... A bone, when left in the sun, the marrow dries out and it gets hollow. So you're halfway there, right? And this particular 60,000-year-old flute had three holes. Okay? And when they played it, the four notes that came out of that flute are the central four notes of the minor pentatonic scale. Now, for us musicians, we go, oh, God, we play that every day. <laughs> I just got, fort I just had a very fortuitous thing happen. The La Jolla Symphony has just contracted me to write a piece for their orchestra for 2021, where I'll be playing all indigenous instruments with the La Jolla Symphony. Now, how can I do that <clears throat> with primitive instruments and a symphony orchestra? Real easy. That Neanderthal who made that flute had no freaking idea what he was doing. He didn't go, oh, F sharp, should go to B flat. <laughs> he didn't know. I, here's what happened. He, this, this bone dried out and he whoo -whoo, made a sound. And it was like, that's kind of cool. And he dropped it one day and it got a hole in it. Then he'd go whoop, 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 whoop. Then his girlfriend dug it, so he poked more holes in it. The whole reason guys come up with music is because chicks dig it. There is no other reason for us to make music. My music career launched off on a great new path the day that, that Elvis Presley played on Ed Sullivan and my 18-year-old sister got Twitter-pated. It was like, that's the job for me. So, let's think about this now, especially us musicians in the audience. If that, that's the oldest instrument we know of that human beings made, okay? 
60,000 years old. It's the oldest, and we've got to remember when it gets older than that, it just disintegrates. We just can't find it. We know that there were humanoids, as many as 115 species of humanoids as far back as 300,000 years ago. Okay, so there were lots of us. We were just the ones that survived. We weren't the biggest or the strongest. We were just the most clever, which is biting us in the ass right now. So if that first instrument, which happened by chance, has the same notes that we still use in composing today, are we creating music? or discovering it. I firmly believe music has always existed and we're just finding it. Music is not a human creation. It's an energetic element of nature. I mean, it's hard to wrap your head around because it's a new idea, but it's the truth. It exists in nature, and we're just discovering it. And I think that old flute proves it. Guy had no clue what he was doing. His girlfriend dug it, he was playing it. That's all there was to it. He was trying to get her in the mood. And she was feeding him for the same reason. Now. Let's take our ancient ancestors here in Summit County. This is a golden eagle wing bone. Now, have you ever watched the osprey and the hawks and the eagles fly around here? Did you wish you could do that? Man, I've spent so many meditations dreaming of growing wings out of my back and taking flight and flying around. It was like, that's, in fact, I'm really hoping that Buddha was right and we get reincarnated because I'm coming back as an osprey. <laughs> they spend the summer in Colorado and the winter in Mexico, I'm in. <laughs> and they eat fresh fish every day. I, uh, awesome, I dig it, I'm, I'm there. Well, the warriors and the, and, the, and the young braves would have watched those birds the same way, with the same wonder and excitement that we have when we watch them, and looked at them as some sacred element because of their lofty view of the world, because they're looking down upon everything else from way up there. And when they found the first carcass of an eagle, they realized that this bird, three and a half feet tall with an eight foot wingspan, only weighs 10 pounds. They're made out of feathers and they have hollow bones. Now, it takes a lot of energy to get 10 pounds in the air, right? So they're not going to weigh any more than that. And after they gorge themselves, they get up to about 14, 15 pounds. And then they have trouble taking off again and some truck runs them over. That's what happens when they eat carrion on the side of the road because they get so heavy from, because they gulp, they don't chew, right? And they rip, they tear and gulp. They were dinosaurs a million years ago, you know? I mean, it's where birds come from. So they take this hollow bone and they think, wow. And they take their knife and they cut a little notch, just the right spot, and here's what you get. Sounds like a bird, huh? So the young hunters would wear these around their neck. Now remember, the tribes are small, right? You know everybody in the tribe. <laughs> there aren't any strangers in the tribe. I mean, you know everybody, and you're going to grow up with the same children, right? And you're going to spend your whole lives hunting and gathering together and working together. So two hunters would each have their own whistle, and each one sounds different. So they would come up with codes. So we're out hunting. Mike and I are out there with our bows, and I find the herd. Now, he's, I can't see where he is, but I want to let him know I'm not going to go, Hey, Mike, over here! Am 
Mike hears that, and he says, I'm on the way. Right? 10,000-year-old cell phones. No roaming charges. So they used them to communicate, but they also used them in music and in ceremony. And then if we came across a bunch of Arapaho infringing on our hunting ground, we'd blow these and make all kinds of crazy sounds, five or six of us, and scare them and chase them away. And to this day, when they do the sun dance, where the Lakota put hooks in their chest for two days and dance around a pole to go into a trance, they blow the eagle whistle. So it's become sacred and passed through all the tribes. So these are really, really old instruments. And this one was made for me by the Omaha tribe. And, and well, both of them actually. This one's got little birds on it because of my name. And this one, the, the yellow dots, they said, oh, that symbolizes snow. And I said, in Colorado, we don't eat yellow snow. <laughs> So just like that Neanderthal 60,000 years ago, somewhere along the line, somebody got the idea that they should put some holes in the eagle bone whistle. And when they do that, and this is going to sound pretty similar to that cave bare bone flute, but this is what you get. Pretty cool, huh? So I used to ask my dad, whose idea was it to put holes in the eagle bone whistle? And he would think about it and say, huh, the holy man. <laughs> I think he's right. Now remember, the ancestor used, they used everything. You guys can see this? You know what this is? Yeah, a tortoise shell. But if you know what you're doing, So everything, when thought about inventively, becomes an instrument. And there's those notes again, right? So this is the oldest example of a flute that I've ever found. And there was a trading post in Utah, and every time I'd go down that way, I'd go in and I would... He made fabulous Navajo pottery. And I would trade with him for pots, and I would trade him my CDs. Because he could sell those, right? Because that was something he could sell. And so I would see this in this case, and for years it was there. It had saran wrap wrapped around it, so you couldn't play it. It was dusty, and it, was, it had been there. I had seen it for 15 years. And finally one day I said, so what's the story on this? old flute down here. I mean, it's, it, you never touch it. It's full of, it's been sitting in the same spot for 15 years. It's full of dirt. You know, it doesn't work. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I collect flutes and can, is you mind if I, would you like, would you think of trading me? And he goes, six CDs. And I said, done. I mean, you know, how old is it? And he goes, ah, it was 150 years old when my dad got it. He's been dead for 50 years. I was a curmudgeon old guy. I was like, great. So I took it out and goes, it doesn't work. <laughs> so I took the stuff off that was on there. It was cracked off like it was just. <laughs> and I messed with it for a little while. And then I got this. And he says, a dozen CDs. <laughs> so this is made of river cane. Now, river cane is the cousin of bamboo, but it grows around here. And one reason river cane would be a really favorable material to use for a flute is the inside is pulpy and soft, and you can clean it out with a stick. So it's real easy to work with. And the outside's hard, like bamboo. So it was very favorable for them to make the first flute. So this is 
the closest example to probably anything you'll ever see of what the first Native American flutes really look like. But Native American flute has become, and here's the modern version of it. You can buy these in gift shops. And so they're still around. So my fascination with flute music has afforded me traveling all over the country playing on major world-class stages and with symphonies and string quartets and just an amazing life. But the stories of how the first flute came was really my most intense focus. How did the first flute, how did we get that first flute, what happened? So I know 15 different stories from 10 different tribes about how the first flute came and I'm going to tell them all to you today. <laughs> so four more hours and we're done. I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest conversion of uh, how it's kind of the, the greatest hits list of the stories of how the first flute came. So back again 10,000 years ago, small village. And in this village lives a young man. It's very clear to everyone in the village that this special young man someday will be the chief. He's the fastest runner, the most prolific in the hunt, the bravest in battle. And all the other young men look up to him. There's only one thing that this gifted, talented, handsome, young, strong boy can't do. He can't talk to the girl he loves. Every time he tries to express to her how he feels, it's as though his mouth fills with pebbles. <laughs> and all the other boys are chatting her up, making her laugh, and he's thinking, oh God, she's going to fall in love with someone else. If she doesn't marry me and have my children, my life is ruined. I have to do something. I have to figure out a way to express my love for this woman. I love her so much I can't even find the word. This sounds familiar, huh, guys? <laughs> Every guy is going, uh-huh, and all the girls are going, oh, that's funny. All the guys are going, oh, oh, I know, I know exactly how that feels. <laughs> so he does what any smart, strong, young man would do. He goes off in the woods by himself for three days. <laughs> right? Very male solution. I'm going to go off in the woods for three days. And he fasts and he prays and he asks the ancestors to give him a way to express his love to this girl. And after three days of chanting, fasting, no water, no food, no sleep, the ancestors look favorably upon the purity of his heart and they send to him a talking woodpecker. <laughs> And his name isn't Woody. <laughs> and the woodpecker lights on a branch above where the young man is sitting and says, Of course, right? What else would he say? <laughs> now that's the language that this young boy speaks. And it means, come with me, don't be afraid. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if I've been fasting for three days and a woodpecker starts talking my language and says, come with me, don't be afraid, I'm going with him. <laughs> and the woodpecker takes this young man into the forest deeper than any human being has ever been before. And there on a hill is an enormous tree. This tree is so big that its branches disappear into the clouds in the sky. This tree is so big that its roots reach into the earth for miles. This tree is so big that if you walk around it, it takes 10 minutes to return to your starting point. And on one side of the tree, there's a hollow opening and the woodpecker instructs the young man Stay in this opening for three more days. <laughs> so the young man prays and fasts in the opening of the sacred tree for three days, 
while the woodpecker is diligently working away on one branch. On the third day in the afternoon, as often happens here in the forests of Colorado, a great thunderstorm starts to broil. And lightning is striking the trees in the forest below the hill where the sacred tree resides. And as the lightning gets closer, this young man who is afraid of nothing stands in front of the tree with his bare chest and outstretched arms as if to protect the tree from the lightning with his naked body. And the lightning strikes the very branch where the woodpecker has been pecking. And the branch falls into the young man's hands and the woodpecker has made holes in the branch. And the lightning has hollowed out the branch. And the woodpecker has made his own image and likeness on the end of the branch so the boy will never forget him. And he teaches him the songs of the woodpecker. Little by little, as the young man gets more familiar with this instrument he's never heard or seen before, he thinks, oh, the songs that grandmother and mother used to sing at night in the camp. And it dawns on him, this is it. This is how I tell her how I feel about her. When she hears me play, it will reveal the sincerity and love in my heart to her, and she will fall in love with me. So he hastens his way back to camp. Now remember, everybody in the village knows where he went. There aren't any secrets. They all know that where he went. They all know what he's up to. And he comes back, and from a distance before he gets to the camp, he starts to play. And everyone gathers around as he walks up to the young girl's lodge. And he plays for her. And she doesn't come out. <laughs> Sound familiar, guys? So he plays some more. And she doesn't come out. Now the whole village is sitting around really digging this. This is cool. They've never heard music like this before. They've never seen an instrument like this before. Everybody thinks, wow, this is something special. But she's not coming out of her lodge. Finally, the sun starts to go down. And everyone from the village goes back to their camp to have dinner and turn in for the night. And he's still playing. And she doesn't come out. And the moon rises. The night is starting to get cold. And a single cloud passes over the moon, and the night becomes dark. And his song has changed.
And as he turns to walk away, she emerges from her lodge wearing a white buckskin dress adorned with turquoise and elk's teeth that her mother and grandmother had made for her wedding night. And in her arms, she is carrying the family blanket. And if she wraps him in this blanket, then she takes him as her husband. And she wraps him in the blanket and takes him into her lodge where she has been cooking elk backstrap and sweet corn cakes because she knows where he's been. And she wants him strong for their wedding night. And there's probably a bath in there, too. You just spent six days in a tree. <laughs> so the next morning, as the happy couple emerges from her lodge, the entire village is waiting there for them because it's very clear to them that this was a marriage that was meant to be. Now, one thing I forgot to tell you. In every one of these stories, the young girl is always the chief's daughter. <laughs> Not only the best looking babe in camp, all the wampum. So what do you think every young man in camp now wants? So what I told you is a 10,000 year old story of the first rock star. <laughs> Now, we still use flutes to this day in rites of passage, and when a young man is becoming coming of age, and we're explaining to him how things work, we teach him to play the flute so that the young girls can recognize his heart and his sincerity, so that he can express himself through music and let people know where he comes from. So, Somewhere along the line, some bright young guy said, man, if one flute gets the chicks, <laughs> what would three flutes do? Now, I got to warn you girls. You may get a little Twitter-pated. Thank you all, the beautiful energy. Thank you, you've been a wonderful audience. And I hope that this has been enlightening and fun for you and informative. And, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So sweet of you, it's very generous. <clears throat> it, to honor the ancestors, and since this is a gathering of our tribe, you know, I look here and I see all of you and you're my tribe. This is our tribe that we're going to end in a traditional way. And once again, I want to invite you to come up and look at the instruments and at the, at the map and to ask questions. Uh, I'm not in a hurry. The bar will still be open when I get out of here. <laughs> so what we're going to do now is a blessing to all of you. And I'm going to play a little song on the flute. And then I'm going to do the blessing in a 10,000-year-old language. So you will hear the way that the ancestors actually spoke. And this blessing is to enlighten the stories of your life and to encourage you to pass it on to young people. We have to tell children the truth. When I held that map up, and we started talking about the truth about history, 
It's very important now that kids know the truth because there's a reason they call them cell phones because you get locked up in them, <laughs> right? And so we're the elders, and it, the burden is on us. And we need to take it seriously, and we, and we need to teach the truth so that history doesn't repeat itself because it, it looks like it's going to. So we, we really, we, th that's what this blessing is for, to give us courage and to give us words and to inspire us to be blessed by nature, okay? Many blessings. Wonderful audience, thank you.